Hello everyone, I bought the Befaku Voltio DIY kit a while ago, and now it's time to build it. The Voltio is an accurate voltage source that can output CV voltage according to the 1 volt per octave standard, using one knob for 1 volt steps and one knob for 12 semitones. The output voltage range can be 0 to 10 volt or plus minus 5 volt selectable using a switch. The module also has a summing input so it can be used as a precision adder. The kit comes with all the parts needed to complete the build of the module. And you will only need a soldering pen, some solder and the usual tools like side cutters, pliers and a screwdriver. Befaco have their own nuts for the jacks and the switch and they have included a special tool for that in the kit. There is also a small tube of glue in the kit that will be used to encapsulate all the thermally sensitive components. The module is built up around a main board and a control board, which are interconnected with pin headers and held together using a standoff with a nut and a screw. There are some pre-soldered SMT components on the board, like ICs and precision resistors, but most of the components are actually through-hole type. All the documentation are online and there is an assembly guide and then an interactive bomb as well. And I recommend to use both actually, since the iBOM is a great help to locate all the components on the board. And the assembly guide tells you in which order to assemble everything. Which is quite important since certain things need to be assembled and soldered in a specific order. But enough talking, let's get started. The first step in the instruction is to place the 1N4148 diodes and solder them in place. Each of the SMT voltage regulators have four diodes soldered on top of them. The marking on the diode should be aligned with a small line that is drawn between the legs of the SOIC8 package. And all the 1N4148 diodes should be placed in the same direction on the board. Try to keep the diode as close to the top of the IC without causing a short circuit. The diodes and the ICs will be embedded in a thermal glue later on in the build. We have two more 1N4148 diodes that should be placed next to the power connector and they should be placed in the same direction as the previous ones. Save the component legs because we are going to use them for the ferrite beads later on. Finally we have the slightly larger black Schottky diodes. Please mind the markings on the PCB, because they are placed in the opposite direction from the previous diodes. Next up is the ferrite beads. They need the waste component leads from the diodes to connect to the PCB. They have no polarity or markings, so you don't need to worry about placing them the wrong way. Let's move on with the IC sockets. It is highly recommended to place them with the notch face in the same direction as the marking on the PCB silk print. The IC socket doesn't have any polarity of course, but you should do this to avoid confusion. Otherwise you may risk that you insert the IC the wrong way. Next we have the 100 nanofarad MLCC capacitors marked 104. These are not polarized, so you can mount them in any direction. We also have the 1 nanofarad marked 102 that should be mounted next. And finally, the 10 picofarad ceramic capacitors marked with a 10. Finally, we have the 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitors. They are polarized, so carefully check the plus and minus marking on the component case and on the PCB before you solder them in place.
The next component should be the pin headers. There are two of them and they must be soldered perfectly flush to the PCB, otherwise the two boards will not fit together properly. There's a couple of ways of doing this, but I'm using the method to solder one pin first and check the alignment after that. And if needed, I will adjust it until I'm happy with the result and then I solder the rest of the pins. I use basically the same way of working when I solder the boxed power connector in place. Starting with one pin, check that it is properly seated, and when I'm happy with it, I solder the rest of the pins. Let's continue with the multi-turn trimmer pots. All of them have the same value, so you don't need to worry about placing them in the wrong spot. But the brass screws should be placed towards the PCB edge. Watch the marking on the PCB so you place them the correct way. Also be careful not to heat them too long, because they are a little bit sensitive to high temperature. The final step here is to insert the ICs into the sockets and tear the boards apart. Don't throw away the small PCB with the solid copper fills on both sides. This will be used with a thermal glue to make a temperature chamber around the diodes and the voltage regulator ICs, but uh, more on that later. Okay, we have reached one of the most difficult parts of this build, and that is the rotary switches. The challenge here is that at first glance they look absolutely identical. But one is used for the semitone selector and that one has 12 positions. The other one is used for the octave selector and that one has 11 positions. So there is a 50-50 chance of disaster here. The only visual difference are the placement of the stoppers on the bottom side. So you could use that as a guide. But the most foolproof way of making sure that you get it right is to place the switches in the PCB temporarily and turn them by hand and count the numbers of positions you get. When you know which one is which, you can put them in their correct location and solder them in place. It is very important that they are soldered flush to the board, so be careful. Solder one pin first, check the alignment and solder the rest after that. We are almost finished with the main board now, and the remaining step is to solder the female header connector on the bottom side of the control board, facing the main board. This is to prepare for the control board assembly. But before we move on to the control board, we should apply the thermal conductive glue over the voltage regulator ICs and the diodes on the main board. For this we will need the small PCB, the thermal glue and some kind of spatula or toothpick to apply the glue. Start by applying the glue over the diodes and use the toothpick to work the glue into the gaps between the components in every nooks and crannies. After that you can apply another layer of glue and spread it out so it doesn't contain any air pockets. Apply layer by layer until you have used up most of the glue in the tube. And yes, it is a bit messy. Place the small PCB on top of the glue and press it in place. But make sure that the glue doesn't get into the board to board connectors. It's okay if it sticks out on the side of the PCB because we can cut it to shape when it's fully cured. So the curing of the glue will take many hours according to the instructions, but it will barely be dry to the touch after a couple of hours. It will take more than 24 hours for it to fully cure, so let's put it aside and continue with the control board. To complete the control board we will need the panel, toggle switch, banana jacks, 3.5mm jacks, shafts for the rotary switches, panel nuts, and the LEDs. Remove the nuts from the banana jacks and since the soldering lugs are a bit too long you will need to cut them with a suitable tool. 
We will double check the height later on and adjust it so it doesn't collide with the mainboard. Insert the shafts of the rotary switches and make sure that they are properly seated. Attach the banana jacks to the front panel and dry fit it against the control board to see how much of the soldering lugs that needs to be trimmed. After that you can screw it in place using the special tool for the nuts. Next you place the toggle switch jacks and LEDs and put the panel in place. The longer leg of the LED should be towards the plus sign on the PCB. Do not solder anything yet. Now you can attach the nuts to the jacks and toggle switch and screw them in place with a special tool. Now when the panel is secured, check that the panel is parallel to the PCB and solder the jacks, LEDs and the toggle switch. Do not solder the banana jacks yet. We will do that later. Ok, after the glue has cured properly, we can trim the outer edge of the PCB from excess glue. Use a sharp knife for that. Next step is to add the spacer between the main board and the control board. This step could actually have been done earlier, but I couldn't figure out which way to put it, so I waited until the last step of the build. We need to use the standoff and the nut to attach it to the control board. To do this you will need to remove the panel again and screw the spacer in place using the M3 nut. After that you can put it back and solder the banana jack connectors to the control PCB. So now you can attach the main board to the control board and screw it in place using the M3 screw. The last step is to attach the knobs to the rotary switches. I used the dark grey one for the semitones and the other one for the octave switch. The build is now completed and it's time to calibrate the module. For the calibration you will need a good multimeter, at least 4 digits and a small screwdriver for the trim pots. Start by powering up the module for at least 20 minutes before you start calibrating it, so the temperature has stabilized around the voltage regulators. The first calibration step is to put the range switch to plus minus 5 volt, set the octave switch to 5 and the seminode switch to C. Adjust the plus minus offset trimmer until the multimeter show as close to zero volt as possible. Next put the range switch to zero to 10 volt. Set the octave switch to zero. Adjust the 0 10 offset trimmer until the multimeter shows as close to 0 volt as possible. Next, set the octave switch to 10. Adjust the octave trimmer until the multimeter shows as close as possible to 10 volt. Now, if you want to increase the accuracy, you can repeat these three steps until you reach a point where no or very small adjustments are needed for each step. When you are happy with the result, you can continue with the remaining steps of the calibration procedure. Ok, the next step is to set the octave switch to 0 and the seminode switch to B.
adjust the semi-note trimmer until the multimeter shows as close as possible to 0.9167 volt. The last step is a little bit more complicated. We will adjust the offset error of the summing input, so we will need to connect an input signal to the sum in jack. In my case I'm using a 5 volt signal that I get from my Eurorack case. We also need to move the negative lead of the multimeter to a test point on the PCB. With all that done, adjust the CV in trimmer until the multimeter shows as close to zero as possible. And with that, the calibration procedure of the Voltio module is completed. So the Voltio module is a great addition to my lab bench setup, and I will use it as a reliable voltage source when testing my module designs. It is of course possible to use it in a more musical context. YouTuber DivKid has done a great video showcasing this. I will leave a link in the description if you want to check that out. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching and I hope you found this video useful. See you in the next one. Bye for now and take care.